Now this special presentation tonight sounds very exciting, the future of electronics from a panel of scientists closely concerned with limiting the ever-expanding amount of energy we're consuming from our rapidly growing technology sectors. Fleet's main aim is low energy electronics, so that's the, the end game I guess. Um, and there's a, a few different sort of research streams that are heading towards that. Carlos, Rebecca and Mira are going to talk to you about some of the background of uh, computing uh, to put it into context and about Moore's Law and also um, sort of unpicking a major issue of uh, electronics that will unfold in the next decade or two and what this will mean for computing. Um, and finally some relatively new fields of physics that should hold solutions to those issues. The main two areas are um, using a new type of material called topological materials. Um, uh, so topological materials have sort of been theorised for about 20 years. They won the Nobel Prize two years ago. Uh, so they're quite new um, and people are very excited about them. There's a lot of very exciting things that they seem to be able to do. Um, but there's, the challenges of them have sort of been that they won't operate at room temperature, which means you'd need to super cool your computer, which costs you more energy than you save. Uh, and also that they're very hard to turn off and on, which is what you need to be able to do with a computer component. Um, and then the other main stream is superfluids, which are a quantum state where you don't have resistance to charged particles moving. 1965, Gordon Moore predicted what that is a law, they said it's a law, is that the number of the, those transistors in a microchip, you're gonna double every two years. It's not actually a law, it's more like a prediction or I would say like a, a guideline, like a, how much things we can compact and process. Intel produced like 14 nanometer across the size of the transistor. Okay? And inside of that phone, we do have 4.3 billion transistors just in the microchip. I can put more transistors inside of the microchip of the phone just to make the microchip big. But that means we lose. The prediction is not there anymore. And that's why when trying to keep up with that law, and that's why you don't want the, the Moore's law end, because it's actually a very good grow, like exponential growth in the technology and keep the size constant and just put more transistors there. While we've been forecasting the end of Moore's law for decades, we are reaching the physical limits of how small we can get if they're just 14 nanometers across. What happens though when we do get as small as we can get? Well, when this happens, we will have actually reached the end of one interpretation of Moore's law, and we'll need to find new ways of expanding our computing power if we ever hope to keep pace with our current level of technological advancement. What about another aspect of technology and computing that we don't really think about, just the amount of power that it uses? Approximately 8% of the entire energy output of the planet goes towards powering computers and, and communication technology, and that amount is doubling every decade. We tend to focus in fleet more on just the energy uh, efficiency and expenditure of materials, but yeah, there's a whole class of um, various different types of materials that can capture and, uh, and convert energy. Um, so in terms of you know, rubbing it against your pocket, maybe we could have a component of it that's piezoelectric, so converting mechanical stress into electrical energy. We're all pretty familiar with a phone or a laptop getting a bit too hot or possibly a, a flight risk. Uh, and this is because much of the energy stored in the battery doesn't actually go towards running the smartphone. It's dissipated as heat. The iPhone 8 has 4.3 billion transistors in the microchip, but only about a third of those are ever actually firing at any one time because the rest of them just need to cool down so that they can get bit, uh, be used. So there's lots of uh, things going on in lots of different spheres that when we have something that's a bit more efficient and a bit put together, we can hopefully all kind of put together and make one nice, happy device. <laughs> Not even the size, but the technology itself and the materials need to be changed so that they could be more efficient at dissipating this heat. For all these reasons, creating materials that are more energy efficient in terms of heat dissipation is a vital step, not just in creating the next wave of technology, but just taking advantage of what we already have. And we're also spending a lot of energy even just cooling down. So we've got this issue of losing a lot of energy and then we're also spending energy cooling it. So it's just sort of this double, double whammy. And all of that is essentially, like I, like I think all of that is essentially being powered by coal, power, well, coal <laughs> or, or fossil fuels, which is, which is a big problem. Um, so we want to obviously reduce that 
that um, the carbon footprint, I guess, of, of computation. We need to um, move electrons around in order to perform computations. So we need to have electrical currents in order to actually be able to you know, you know, flip those zeros and ones and actually be able to compute whatever we, whatever we want to compute. Here's a schematic diagram of a conventional transistor, so where we're trying to take an electron, say, from one side to the other. They tend not to go smoothly. They tend to hit obstacles along the way. And the issue is there is that as soon as it hits an obstacle or a defect, it, it loses its energy, and, and that energy is basically lost as heat. So that's, that's essentially a sort, of a sort of simple picture of what's, why we're actually losing a lot of our energy in these, in these uh, computers. Processes like these means that we're m very, very far away, many orders of magnitude far away, in fact, from realizing an, um, a, the, you know, the perfectly efficient computer that the laws of physics would allow. And so that gives us um, sort of possibilities to explore new ways in which one can realize um, um, different, different materials, different computers. One thing is is the the possibility of of miniaturizing it, you know, re reducing it, and you know, having having it at the atom level. We have new new types of materials that are one atom, essentially one atom thick. We're actually entering a whole new realm of different different um, two dimensional or atomically thin materials, where you can have new you know different architectures, different structures. You can even stack them on top of each other. You have a lot of flexibility, a lot of control, and this in turn allows you to even look into different types of new, you know, electrical properties. The fact that you've changed effectively the dimensions, so you've gone from 3D to 2D, and that, that at least, um, that will even change the type of topological character that you can have in these, um, these materials. Another possibility is, what about if we can get the electrons to organize themselves in a way so that they can flow in a very ordered manner? One example of, of such a thing that's very organ organized, very ordered, very coherent, is, is light. Question then is, well, can we actually imbue the electrons with this same kind of organized character? And one, one option is, actually, amazingly enough, you can actually engineer a, a setup where you have uh, a mixture, essentially, of light and matter, or light and electrons. And so the hope then is that we can use this to actually allow electrons to flow also without dissipation, without heat, uh, energy loss. Moore's law, as we know it, may be ending, but that doesn't mean our advancement has to end at all. So as scientists, we're navigating these problems of energy consumption and heat dissipation and to create materials for this new world.